Hey colleagues, on behalf of Renouveau Democracy, I would like to thank you for your participation. Thanks also to Delphine Minkela for accepting our invitation. And this is the second conference with Delphine on the workspace and more specifically on hot desking. Delphine holds a PhD in management sciences on the relationship between organizational space and management. Her main work focuses on management of workspaces, associated services, and third places. Delphine is a researcher in the Métis Laboratory of the École de Management de Normandie in France. Today, Delphine will speak on the topic between spatial justice and spatial privilege, what is at stake with regards to each one's place at work. Now I give the floor to Cristiano Sebastiani, President of Renouveau Democracy, who will present our trade union activities and the policies that stand for them. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, many thanks, Dikra, and uh, thank you again to Delphine to be with us. The, the first conference was quite successful. Um, I think, Delphine, that you are now more or less understood what we are facing inside our own institution. Uh, there is a commissioner who is preaching uh, cultural trust, leading by example, and then there is the rest of the institution who doesn't seem to trust that the culture can change. And I mean, offices, spaces, uh, the quality of the, the chairs, uh, parking spaces, uh, the size of the windows in our institution has always been considered to be uh, the privilege for the managers. Uh, you you deserve to have uh, some squ square meters, you deserve to have uh, so many windows, you deserve to have your parking space. And then it seems to be considered to be an acquired right that cannot be challenged, cannot be put in question by some. Uh, uh, Others are totally understanding that if you want to change the way on which this institution works, they must also accept to, to renounce to some of these uh, French benefits that they are totally uh, a bit not really in line of what one could expect to, to get in our institution today. Uh, when the odd desking has been introduced, not really as a consequence of a change of culture, but just in order to save money for the building policies. Uh, the first question was, how can we deal with the managers, how they could accept eventually to get an desking as the rest of the staff? I they could eventually accept to, to lead by example also in this respect. And we, we had faced a, a very different reaction. Um, most of the managers are duly understood that they cannot keep their own way to have their own offices while the rest of the staff is just struggling with the desking. Uh, we had a very good example of the director general of the administration, even the cabinet of the commissioner was accepted to play the role. And others were in total contradiction, preaching or desking for the rest of the staff, reserving for themselves the most beautiful and uh, luxury office. And when we have tried to, to challenge this way to work, um, we got very strong reaction saying that we were dis disrespectful. Uh, one can also understand that uh, a manager needs to have his own office or her own office in order to have private meetings and whatever. Um, and also we, we have tried to explain that what we were uh, putting forward was not just our own way to, to see things, but just to rely on the studies and things that have been already made elsewhere. Because I, I suppose Delphine that you know the reputation of the commission to be the bureaucratic, technocratic institution. So we are considered to be at the top of the knowledge while sometimes we have the feeling that we are more on the bricolage. We don't take into account the best products that we are preaching to the member states. We start things that have already been done in the past without making profit of to be late and then to know and to be, to, to be able to rely on the past experiences. And when it comes to, to have the three famous B, bricks, byte and behaviors, I think that we are very good on bytes 
our IT system works was able to to fulfill the the goal even during the pandemic. For the bricks and the, and the building policies, we are not really up to the standard. But for the behaviors, we are really nowhere uh, because the the pretension is, is to change the offices to adapt to the IT system without changing anything on the behaviors. How can we dare to pretend that a manager can renounce to the parking space? Uh, when I made uh, some years ago a leaflet mentioning that uh, parking space that are now reduced must be given to those who deserve it or need it and not to be empty for a manager that they didn't come by their car. I got so strong reaction being accused to, to put in question colleagues uh, on which grounds can I pretend to do it? So that is important to, to understand when it comes to discuss the content of the conference today, because you are someone coming from outside, uh, mm -hmm. just presenting to us experiences and also underline that how offices are organized for managers is not just a detail, is part of the full picture to be provided if we want really to establish this cult of a trust that our commissioner is preaching sometimes in the desert. <laughs> so, thank, thank you again, <laughs> Delphine. The floor is yours. Many thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be with you today and uh, to, to have this discussion about this very important matter uh, that is space. Uh, so I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Could you please confirm me that you all can see it? Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, uh, well, so this conference for today is entitled The Leading by Example, as you said, as you mentioned, uh, in terms of offices. And, uh, well, this conference is mainly based on a recent academic paper that I published along with my colleague Sébastien Bourdin. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't attend today, but I'm glad to represent him as well. So, um, as an introduction, I would like to uh, spend a few moments on uh, this notion of leading by example, indeed. Um, because, well, the, the, the original title of my art um, is actually the struggle for places and for this communication of today it was translated into leading by example in terms of offices. What is really very interesting in this translation is that actually, um, well, leading by example, it cannot be otherwise. Uh, the system, the very system of leadership implies exemplarity. Why that? Uh, let's come back to the very simple definition of what a leader is. A leader is somebody who has followers, okay? Those followers, those individuals uh, willingly choose to follow this leader. Why that? Simply because this leader is able to depict a, a, a better vision of a better society or a better organization, something that is worth fighting for, making efforts to reach his goal, okay? So this is to um, go, you know, to have this vis vision achieved that people are ready uh, and willing to follow the leaders. And his behavior as a leader is actually the path to follow. That is why exemplarity is so important when it comes to leadership. Uh, it needs to share the same faith as the others, because if something is good for the followers, therefore it must be good for the leader as well. Otherwise, uh, this is not about leadership, this is about management. And so this is not, this is no longer about having people willing to follow you, this is about having people to obey you. So you see the difference between leadership 
and management. And here we are dealing with leading by example. And of course, as you said, um, this exemplarity goes through is everyday, everyday sorry, work condition as well. So that's why it's so important to uh, to to be able to set an example also in terms of offices. Why that? Simply because space actually speaks louder than words. So, um, well, as said a few minutes ago, um, um, this uh, conference is based on an article uh, that was recently published in uh, an academic review entitled Revue Internationale de Psychosociologie et de Gestion des Comportements Organisationnels. And, um, and so, if you are willing to read the full document, um, I'd be very glad to provide you with it. Uh, you can have it in in English version, but also French version, you just have to send me an email and um, you will get your document. So uh, this uh, article is important, I think, uh, if we consider your uh, current situation, uh, not because it deals, yes, yes. Oui, excusez-moi, um, si vous pouviez passer les slides dans, parce que là on voit les petites euh, étiquettes. Oh. Oui, en présentation. Merci. Is it better like that? Yes. Voilà, c'est parfait. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, as said, um, this uh, academic article uh, is actually not based on a hot desking system. Um, but I still think that it's really relevant for the current situation you are facing today. Why that? Because of two very significant concepts, uh, that is spatial justice and Village. Uh, well, actually, these two uh, concepts were already uh, well known in social geography, but no one uh, before us uh, dealt with them uh, in an organizational setting. Um, and uh, from the moment that it was published uh, in this organizational setting, we Sebastian and I received a lot of comments of uh, working people telling us that this is still the situation that they face today and uh, this is a major uh, issue for them uh, to be able to deal with this spatial justice and injustice, of course, and the way um, managers will try to maintain and protect their spatial privilege. So, in this um, conference, I will highlight the way we um, discovered these two concepts within a case study and also uh, the consequences uh, this situation had on employees, employees' behaviors, and also on the organization. So, uh, to deal with it, I think that it's more relevant to start with uh, the case study uh, that was the basis of our um, So, this was actually a longitudinal case study. The starting point of it was um, an intern document from an international, a large international banking group. Uh, and well, this document that was um, um, an architectural project to create the new headquarter of this very large um, international banking group. And so they as a matter of fact, wanted to gather all their uh, back office and they wanted to enhance um, indoor communication, whether formal or informal, it doesn't matter. They really thought at that time that communication was the key to succeed. And so um, this uh, headquarter project was more than important for them. So it Started, our research started with this 1989 document uh, that was written by the main executive directors of this group. And then um, six years later, that is to say in 1995, uh, a twin tower emerges 
emerged sorry, uh, from the ground. So that was their new headquarter. It was located in La Défense, and actually it was the largest uh, headquarters in Europe at that time. And, and then as researchers, we uh, were able to follow um, more than 25 years of social practice within the building. Okay, and so um, this longitudinal, longi longitudinal sorry, uh, case study was interesting also because it was not only about architecture, it was also about management. We were at a time when um, managers started to understand that bottom-up was also very important to consider and that top-down management uh, was not enough to make good decisions and to uh, remain alive as an organization. And so people, uh, I mean, uh, directors, management, started to understand that they needed to hear what the bottom of the hierarchy had to say uh, in order to uh, make the top able to uh, produce, uh, to make good decisions, actually. So, um, they started to think, well, okay, if this uh, bottom-up management system is so important, then we need to gather all our um, back offices all together in the same location and make sure that everybody gets along together and that they talk and uh, from a transversal point of view, you see, so the HR will talk to the financial department and so on and so forth. And so, um, <clears throat> They really explain uh, their managerial ambitions through uh, this uh, 1989 document. It was crystal clear that they wanted to make a new way of working emerging from uh, this um, shared location for everyone. And so because this uh, large international uh, banking group had money at that time, quite a lot of money, uh, they were not constrained uh, in terms of architecture. So it means that um, what they wished for, they could have. See? So um, they published actually this uh, 1989 document uh, in order to select uh, the, 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 best, um, the best team to conduct this architectural project. So inside this uh, 100 page document, they described uh, the places for inter informal interactions. They also described the way uh, the offices uh, should be because they wanted everyone uh, to feel comfortable in this, uh, this uh, new uh, working environment. So they thought about the square meters, they thought about the temperatures, so you had an individual control in order to make sure that you could control if you were too cold or too hot. And also they said that open plan was not the solution. <laughs> it's funny to read it and to know that it was written in 1989 and, and today we are still dealing with open plan. But anyway, and so they said that, um, well, uh, shared office, but uh, small offices would be uh, the best solution to provide to their employees and so on and so on. So when you read uh, the full document and you know that they had no financial constraint to uh, produce a, a perfect Perfect headquarter. So um, you read it, and you're, you you really want to discover, you know, the the construction of it and the way it was built and lived inside. And so I came across this document uh, when I was um, when I was still a doctoral student, and so I was interested in knowing how the macro zoning, that is to say, how people get their places in this new environment. So, um, <clears throat> but before going further, um, well, I may assume that maybe somebody is thinking at the moment when I'm speaking that, well, this case is maybe too old to do, too, too old, sorry, to be dealt with, that it's not really significant because, well, this is a, a banking group that it's not, uh, 
that it's not um, the same organization as you, that they were dealing with um, territorial offices and non hot desking. Well, I may agree with you, but the thing is, thing is, um, these two con these two concepts of spatial justice and spatial privilege uh, are still really relevant today, even in your organization, as far as I know, and as far as I've understood the situation. Uh, what else? Um, if it was not an old case, if, if it was a, a current case, I'm not sure that I would have had access to uh, key actors of that project. Um, because as you will see in a few minutes, uh, I was able as a researcher to interview um, the key actors of the project. And because they were retired at the moment they discussed with me, they were free you know, to, uh, to reveal uh, the way the macro zoning was done. Okay, so that's the reason why I do believe uh, that this case is still really uh, relevant for the current situation. Uh, then, so um, about collecting data. So what did I do uh, with Sebastian in order to collect data? Well, as a matter of fact, we, um, we had um, two main strategies. The first one was to collect documents uh, from the archives. It was uh, very important uh, because we wanted to be able uh, to set up the, the detailed chronology of uh, the whole project and the service settlements within the new uh, building and uh, the way it evolves through the years. It was very important for us uh, to have this, uh, you know, bunch of official documentation. On the other hand, as I said, we were able to have uh, to conduct face-to-face um, -face, uh, individual interviews, first with key actors of the project in order to know uh, what was behind the scene, you see, and also uh, from, I would say, um, regular employees at that time, uh, that is to say from the first inhabitant of this new headquarter um, and also uh, current uh, employees of this organization working in, in this um, headquarter, which is not new anymore. See, so it was pretty uh, important for us to be able to compare the official history of this uh, headquarter to the way it was lived uh, and perceived by employees, former employees and current employees. Up, uh, up. So um, basically, just in order to show you the way it was conducted, because this is a qualitative research. Um, so at first, we were not that sure uh, what would be what our conclusions would be. We did not know actually the the, the whole story behind, and so you know it was really uh, a research in the dark. And so um, first, um, we were able to see that through official documentations from the company, especially not regions. Uh, by uh, the executive directors, it was really very important for them uh, to uh, to um, offer some spatial uh, justice. Uh, that is to say that they ensure uh, equity in terms of comfort uh, for each employee, as I said, uh, being an assistant, being a director, there was no question. In uh, the original document, it was really very important that everybody uh, was um, at least enjoying the same uh, kind of uh, comfort. Then they also wanted uh, to harmonize the way that people were um, experiencing uh, their work environment. And then uh, they wanted to make sure that uh, people could understand the way space was organized. And so all these data, so you have on your screen just a very, very small sample of the verbatims we had from our data collection. And it's just to show you the way we worked on it from 
verbatim to meta categories to theoretical coding to show you that indeed there were a lot of um, a lot of elements to prove that the organization as a whole uh, wanted to set up uh, spatial justice within this new environment. Then, um, when analyzing the data uh, made, uh, well, uh, provided by the, the key actors and employees who settled uh, in this new headquarter, uh, we uh, quickly realized that consideration in terms of spatial privilege. Um, and this word privilege is also very interesting because, well, when you're French and you hear the word privilege, it sounds On vous, euh, Alors, on vous a euh, perdu un instant. Sorry, I'm so sorry for that. Uh, what was it about, if, you're, if you can tell me? Um, uh, was oh, it about the coding? Voilà, c'est parfait. Un état yeah. arrêté, privilège. Et ouais, OK. OK, that's good. And so, yeah, and... Um, as I was saying, uh, this word privilege is funny because it reminds us of aristocracy and uh, as well, the privilege are typical uh, feature, a typical feature of uh, the aristocratic uh, population in France. And so um, uh, it's, it's, it's um, quite interesting to notice the words that uh, the regular employees used when they were dealing with the spatial privilege of the most powerful people of their organization. They said that they were some baronies. They, they were talking about the noble services and the less noble services. They were talking about being close to the king, being close to the good lord, you see? So you have this idea of, um, of hierarchy, you know, within the organization that is really not related to the functions of people, but to the power and the influence of people inside the organization, which is actually not not the same. And so, <coughs> so you see, uh, very quickly, people told us that from uh, this uh, very, um, uh, well, nice project uh, that was able to uh, put people uh, on the same page, well, actually, when we, when we was when we, when it was time, sorry, um, to uh, lead the macro zoning, uh, things did not work the way it sh should have worked. Um, there was at first um, a strategic, uh, a strategic uh, research conducted uh, from an outdoor independent company in order to uh, set up the. Uh, the right location for every services according to uh, their needs of communication and their needs in terms of proximity working, okay? So it was a rather rational approach, and so it was uh, set up by the middle management of this organization. And when uh, the former CEO of uh, this uh, banking system, uh, of this banking group, heard about this uh, independent uh, strategic research that was 
placing everyone within the new headquarter, he said, no, no, we cannot work this way. This is not the way it should be done. Uh, you should, talking about uh, the, the, the manager who was in charge of the macro zoning and who is, as a matter of fact, a huge um, data provider for this research, well, he was told to go first to the most influential um, director of the organization and then to the second most influential and then to the third most influential and then the fourth most influential and so on and so on because um, actually uh, this uh, very rational strategic uh, localization location of a department was not acceptable uh, for uh, the executive uh, committee and for the main directors of this um, organization and so of course what happened when this uh, this uh, person who was in charge of the macro zoning uh, went to ask uh, the, 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 the very influential uh, directors about the location they wanted to have in this new headquarter. Obviously, two things uh, appeared. Um, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not even following my, my own PowerPoint. That's a shame. Um, well, what, what, was, um, what happened at that moment? Well, uh, they wanted to have a very comfortable, a large room for themselves. It was very important, uh, fashion, um, luxury, furniture, and so on and so on, a lot of square meters and blah, 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 obviously. So the substance of the space was really very important. And on the other hand, it was also very, very important for them to be located uh, as close as possible to uh, the, the, the CEO, the president of this organization. And so, obviously, as these two main criteria was uh, followed by each influential directors, what happened at uh, the end of the day um, is that uh, we had the emergence in 1990. Uh, five of those twin towers who should have been twin towers and at the end of the day they were just opposite towers that is to say you had this joke where, that was shared by all the employees all the 5,000 employees of this organization that is you had the credit tower with the CEO at the top of it and then um, you had all the very influential uh, very important directors and on the other tower it was named the debit tower in which you could find the less influential uh, directors and um, people who were actually managing services like HR communication and so on and so on that is to say you know the services that cost money instead of the services well in opposition to the services that um, earn money for the organization see and so it was you know, uh, a kind of joke uh, that um, that was shared by um, by most of uh, the inhabitants of those two towers. So um, I I wrote of a, well uh, I I wanted to share with you some verbatims uh, that I thought were really. Uh, relevant um, and you see so the top layers of the company all wanted to be with a good lord so this uh, location system was really really leading in this organization and uh, what is also very interesting is that you already understand that these very influential and very powerful uh, executive directors who wanted to be as close as possible to uh, the good Lord and who wanted to have a very large office, a very beautiful desk and so on and so on, were the one that when they were all together did right 
altogether the document of 1989 uh, dealing with everybody should be on the same page, everybody should share uh, the same kind of comfort, enjoy nice it should be a managerial tool, these new headquarters, see, and at the end of the day, it was no, as I said, no longer twin towers, but opposite towers. And, um, and so that's it. Um, and so um, to, uh, to, to, to try to um, categorize the way uh, people express their spatial privileges, well, um, there are some um, important elements that we can put forward. First, um, to get to choose. When you have a privilege, you get to choose. If you don't have a privilege, you will uh, you will have to deal with what you're given. You don't have uh, your word uh, on on that matter. And so, as I said, you get to choose, and so you will get a large and luxurious office close to God. Uh, then, uh, if you have spatial privilege then you will be able able sorry to overlap and territorialize the supposed collective area um, so uh, to give you a very simple uh, example so as I told you in the introduction this new headquarter was made as managerial tool to make sure that people could meet even informally meet, see? And so to make it happen, uh, because the executive directors told the architectures, uh, you, 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 have, you, you can do whatever you want, but make sure that people, whoever they are, uh, come to this place and make it happen, okay? We need to have this uh, very informal uh, setting to make sure that people get together and connect to each other. And so um, the, well, uh, the art, well, uh, the architectural team advised for um, a big agora with some shops, okay, on which, in which people could go and buy some things like magazines and so on and so on. And also this, they said, they advised the company um, to create uh, an ID box, you know, uh, to ask people uh, to make them, you know, uh, express themselves about the decoration they would like to they would like to have in this uh, collective area, just to make sure that they would feel comfortable uh, being around and so on and so on. And so this um, ideas box uh, was uh, was done indeed, and it lasted for a few months, and people did uh, participate. To it, and then um, <laughs> when the box was open, uh, the middle management, who was not that fully aware of the things that it was doing, published in an indoor document that I do have discovered. Uh, he published the result of this uh, box of ideas, and. <clears throat> And through it, we saw that a vast majority of people wanted to have uh, what we call jardin d'hiver, see, so um, uh, some trees inside um, the, the organizational settings, you know, but close to a window so that uh, it is nice, you know, with, with plants and nice um, banks and so on and so on. And uh, when the CEO heard about it and heard about those um, suggestions from uh, the common people, I would say, uh, he said, "Well, this is this is so stupid an idea. Uh, this is not of the standard I want this uh, headquarter to be. Uh, therefore, I will be the one to choose um, the way um, how to decorate this place." And he selected only but. Uh, contemporary art uh, based on, you know, uh, huge um, creation, black, white, and gray, see? So very, very um, opposite to what uh, the regular employees wanted to have within uh, this um, collective area. And see, once again, we can um, witness this expression of Spatial privilege, you are able to materialize what is supposed to be collective. 
then another important element of the spatial privilege is to be able to keep disruptors at a distance. So when I say disruptors, of course, I put it into brackets, but uh, it was the word used by the former um, manager that I discussed with for this uh, research. And well, the disruptors in question were the trade unions officers, of course, and um, at the time of the uh, at the time of the settlements in this new headquarter, of course, the trade union representatives wanted to have their office in this new headquarter because it was meant to be the largest um, uh, the largest head office uh, for their organization, and so it was really important for them to uh, meet people, to be around, and so on and so on. And so uh, the executive directors were not happy with this idea, though they know that they couldn't um, put uh, the trade union side new headquarters, and so they decided to organize their office in the basement. You see, so uh, when you enjoy this spatial privilege, you are able to put at a distance uh, the people you don't really appreciate, as well as you can um, build a proximity, a geographical proximity with those who, uh, you know, who share common interests with you. And um, finally, another element is that, for instance, if you're not happy with a part of a project and you do have a privilege, you can um, erase uh, what you see as a problem. So let me give you once again an example. So in the 1999 document, it was decided that um, this new headquarters should have uh, a room, uh, a sports room for everyone to uh, be able to, to do sports in the office. And so, well, once again, remember, it was written by the executive directors. And at the end of the day, in, 1990, uh, in 1995, um, when it was time to uh, set up this uh, sports room, um, the director uh, decided to organize it not so far from um, the, the Agora, and uh, the trade union said, the CEO, CEO sorry, said, uh, yeah, but it's up to us to deal with this kind of activities for the employees. It's it's a tradition, it's up to us to deal with it. And so, you know, um, there was some kind of uh, conflict raising, you know, uh, between uh, the direct, the management and the trade unions on that question. And so at the end of the day, very quickly, uh, the management decided to get rid of uh, this uh, part of the project. See, so those points are really um, the expressions of uh, what is the spatial privilege. Um, on the other hand, you have the oppressed uh, employees, that is, so, that is to say the ones who will, uh, well, suffer from uh, the other's spatial privileges. And uh, why do I use the word suffer? Simply because, um, well, when, when it comes to justice, organizational justice, uh, does it work? Uh, justice, the sense of equity works through comparison. That is to say, um, you will compare uh, what you've got with, with what your neighbors got. And uh, if you consider that what you give to the company is equal to what uh, your neighbor gives to the company, but his reward is higher than what you get, therefore you will feel you know, inequity. And uh, this system of comparing yourself and what you've get what you've got with the others is the way we work on all the aspects of 
our organizational life. And therefore, um, if you compare yourself, if you don't have any kind of privilege and you compare yourself with uh, somebody who enjoys um, some kind of privilege, therefore, uh, you will be hurt, you see, because as said in the introduction, space speaks louder than words. And so it reveals the place you know, the symbolical place the organization is ready to give you, and so the importance you have or you don't have within it, you see? So, but anyway, it does not it does not mean that uh, those who had no privileges uh, in terms of space uh, were hopeless. Well, actually, they had a way, uh, some ways, sorry, uh, to fight against against it. So first, as said before, they mainly uh, use uh, humor and cynicism as a way to resist this uh, expression of spatial privileges. Uh, so this is the story, you know, with the credit tower on the one hand and the debit tower on the other. And this joke was so commonly shared that at the end of the day, even the CEO heard about it. And he told me so. And um, yes, indeed, privileges create jealousy. Yes, and why that? Simply because it's not fair. See? Um, and so um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> when they knew it, you know, because you, you, you must understand that uh, this new headquarter was meant to be uh, the very symbol of the modernity, of the human management, you see, of this banking uh, organization. It was really very important for them to display a very good image, you know, very good reputation. It was all the more important, as I told you, because it was the largest headquarters in Europe at that time. And, you know, so you have this very uh, progressive uh, project and at the end of the day, you have the credit tower and the debit tower, and this is the mere translation of the privileges on the one hand and the others on the other hand, see? So this joke uh, definitely had uh, some damage on um, the, the image of this headquarter. Then, uh, as I said, the people were really willing to denounce uh, the like, uh, the like, sorry, of uh, justice, of spatial justice. What is interesting is that from the end of the Second World War till 1987, this whole company was um, under the control of the French state, you see, and then it was privatized uh, in 1987. And so when it was under the control of the French state, obviously it was very democratic. So everything was based on rules. And so um, what is really funny is that so people knew that if you are a manager with this great with um, experience, therefore you will have an office with two windows and three drawers. And then if you're able to uh, succeed in getting, you know, uh, a better position, therefore you will have uh, a private office for yourself, blah, 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 blah. And because it was about written rules, it was acceptable for them at that time. And from the moment that they um, settled in this new environment and that there were no written rule anymore, but only influence and only power, uh, and not even uh, the hierarchy in itself, because some directors were in the credit uh, tower and others were on the debit tower because it depended on the aristocratic you know, system of the noble services and less noble services, whether you earn money, whether you spend money. See, so um, it, it was uh, it was quite a disaster, and people uh, really denounced it a lot. And um, and um, then, 
people started also to attack all uh, the symbolical uh, dimension of this new space. Um, for instance, well, once again, it's quite funny. Um, for instance, as I told the CEO did not want to have, you know, this very natural decoration within the Agora uh, because it was, um, well, not of his test. And so he wanted to have, um, you know, um, contemporary art and so on and so on. So he did it because he had this uh, privilege uh, to be able to do so. And so there is a huge statue within um, the men and uh, very close to the Men entrance uh, four meter long, and it is entitled the seed. And what is funny, once again, is that uh, people from the inside call it the intrauterine uterine device. And uh, to be honest, uh, it does not look like uh, an intrauterine device at all. But it was a way, you see, uh, to um, ridicule uh, those expressions of uh, privileges from the influential part of the organization. And at the end of the day, um, you, uh, one must not minimize uh, the impact of this uh, symbolic resistance. Why that? Because I said in my previous uh, conference with you, space is at the same time, uh, has at the same time a material dimension and a symbolic dimension. And uh, Obviously, the material dimension will be uh, controlled by those in power, that, by those who, uh, well, have the, the possibility to exert their privilege on it. But as far as the symbolic uh, aspect of space is concerned, well, it's up to uh, everyone to see what you want to see and uh, to spread the word, see? And this is what we call resistance in organization. And one, one must be quite uh, aware of the fact that to resist within an, orga an organization may appear at a first glance as, you know, being, well, meaningless. At the end of the day, this is only about jokes, but it does express that you do not adhere to the institutional uh, discourse anymore. You do not believe in them anymore. And so it is really very meaningful, you see. So it goes way much further than the simple uh, fact of saying that it was a joke, you see. And and then uh, people, uh, because they were fed up of the, of you know, this uh, spatial expression of, um, of of space and so on and so on, they eventually deprived uh, those spaces of their everyday social practice. And if you remember well, uh, what we said with Lusso and Henri Lefebvre, a space as such is just a, a zone, I mean, it's meaningless. A social space uh, starts to mean something for people. And the place, you know, it's when the symbolic meaning of this place is shared by everyone and it can be even sacred. Think, for instance, uh, about the battlefield, you know, when something happened and then it becomes places for commemoration, you know, and these kind of things. This is all about the symbolical aspect of things. And when people stop um, going to places and they stop their ritual, uh, their everyday social practice within a space, it becomes an empty space void of meaning. And this is what we call a non-place, you see. So it's just like an airport. This is something that you cross, you don't even care. It does not, does not mean anything at all. This space could be in uh, the other organization. It does not make any difference. People are not attached to this place anymore. They do not feel connected to the organization. One must always remember that um, the place we are given as an individual within our organization is the materialization of the contract 
with this organization. And as I said, um, uh, well, space displays that we are given speaks la louder than word because it does not lie because it's material. Um, so, um, well, why is that important to maintain justice? Because uh, it is justice is here is here to resolve uh, conflicting uh, claims. See, uh, so for instance, if I consider the verbatims that uh, I've been uh, provided with uh, when talking to former employees, when they told me, you know, before it was you know, it was nicer with the rules and the bureaucratic system because at least we knew what to do in order to enhance the situation we were given. Okay, so there was some kind of hope to enhance the things, but here in this new building with no rules at and only the, um, you know, the expression, the material expression of the spatial uh, privilege, uh, people are left hopeless, you see, and so, and so that's it. And um, so as a, um, as a global conclusion, I would uh, say that um, it would be really a mistake for your organization to consider only the material dimension of, of space. What I'm saying is that uh, to display some spatial privilege and let some managers uh, get some spatial privilege is a concrete and constant proof of, of uh, unfairness and unfairness will lead to resistance and think about for instance the psychological contract you know that was theorized by Rousseau at the end of the 20th century when she said that the psychological contract is the perception of what the company is giving to you in exchange to what you're giving to the company. Well, you understand that this is about the perception we have from the inside and, uh, you know, what we come from uh, compared to what we are providing the company with. And we will always adjust in order to reach a perfect balance to make sure that it's all about equity. And from the moment that you have the feeling that your company is giving you less uh, to you than what it gives to the others, therefore you will lower your contribution to the company, you know? So this is the psychological contract. Another very important point, because well, actually I wanted to, to share with you so much, is the fact that from the moment that people are dissatisfied, they cannot be motivated. Uh, this theory, of course, is not from me. This is from Herzberg, and uh, this is really a major theory about motivation. From the moment that you're not satisfied with what the company is offering you, therefore you cannot be motivated. And if you're not motivated, it does not mean that you will leave the company on the spot because you may have other reasons to remain in this specific company, but you will have a more transactional attitude towards the company. That is to say, if the company asks you for uh, more engagement at work, more support, more blah, blah, blah. You will ask for something in return always. See, this is not what you would do if you were really following a leader, you see. And the last word, well, uh, as I said in my introduction, the leader's power is to be followed by people who willingly adhere to his vision with enthusiasm. And it is because we are perfectly convinced that we are um, making efforts to reach, you know, uh, this better world, this better organization that we are able to, to, to well, to fight for it, see. But once again, um, the path to follow is the leader behavior. If this leader is not able to display exemplarity, therefore this is not a leader anymore, and therefore he has no followers anymore. That's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Delphine, for this uh, very uh, interesting and pertinent presentation. Uh, it's sometimes surprising to see that we live today the same situation that these workers were living 
20 or even more uh, years ago. Uh, what we are going to do with you, if you could agree, is to apply the same logic, the same study to our present situation, uh, applying the same uh, method that has been already recognized to be totally in line with the best products and to, to la rigueur scientifique that we want to have. Um, we will see together how we could select the, the sample of colleagues uh, because we are not facing one fits all solution. Uh, we mm -hmm. are facing situation in which uh, leaders are uh, leading by examples, others are totally not doing that. Uh, so not all, not all hope testing are the same. So we will see together and we will ask colleagues that they are volunteering in this respect to, to be part of this study and to present these results. That will make also more credible our uh, positions because I mean, the first uh, as you, I'm sure you are familiar with, the first reaction whenever we come with this concept is, yeah, always complaining, yes, uh -huh. so, uh, you know the story. And um, for us, it's really crucial, um, our organization, it's really um, making all position based on best products around, not on our own way to see. I'm really glad to see on your presentation several times the, the word ridiculous. Uh, because our communication in this respect was uh, preceded by a quote, uh, uh, rid ridicule never kill anyone, but is uncomfortable, because it's exactly what we live today. Um, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> ridicule ne tue pas autrement, on serait beaucoup moins. Non, I don't know, uh, I see that there are qu questions on the chat. Um, um, Ellen is asking, what has happened in the bank since then? <laughs> oh, uh, well, well, actually, uh, that's, that's terrific. Um, well, uh, actually, the bank did, uh, did not really control its uh, payroll, and it uh, grew and grew and grew and grew. And so uh, the office started to be really very crowded. And um, at the end of the day, uh, well, they're not that happy with working in this environment. And um, at the current situation, uh, people are expecting to have more telework at least two days a week in order to, uh, to, to have a better work environment. What is um, at stake in most organizations that I am studying at the moment is that um, you see there is some kind of vicious cycle happening with the sanitary crisis that we had. Um, organizations uh, tried to um, to grasp this opportunity to save money from the head, from the uh, square meter, see? So they say, okay, so uh, obviously you were able to work from home, so this is a solution that you like. Therefore, what we suggest is that you have some telework and that we reduce the square meter. And so it implies that you will don't, you will have um, a hot desking system or flex office system. You see, so it's uh, reducing, you know, uh, people's place within the organization. And through this physical place, we also tend to silent people within the organization, see, because they are no longer aware of everything that is happening within the organization. And to be really honest with you, they, uh, they stop being that interested in the organizational life, you see. And uh, for me as a researcher, I think that it's not really a very good thing simply because um, we need to step in in order to, uh, to keep our power in place. So to put it in a nutshell, my um, answer to that question is that, well, the this headquarter was so crowded that it was really not nice at all to work in. Um, today, the executive directors, we don't even know if they are still working in this headquarter. You know, um, the fashion to the, well, the trend today is to have several offices in the main um, headquarters of the bank because the, the bank does have several headquarters around Paris. And so you never know when they are 
in uh, one specific um, organization. Yeah, I mean, this mixture between building policy in telework, uh, flexit work, a flexit desk, I mean, it's exactly what we are facing today in the Commission. Uh, and that's why whenever we challenge the desking, we got reaction for those who are really in favor of telework, mentioning be be careful because the telework and desking goes together. If you challenge desking, we could also lose the possibility to go on telework. And, and it's quite ridiculous because those who are really preaching in favor of telework are those who are in charge of the building policies. We had a meeting with those who are dealing with building policies on our institution because so nowadays we are flexible rules on which um, on average we have to, to stay two days per week in the office and three days eventually at home. Uh, and those who are in charge of the building policies in order to sell better their own way to organize our offices, so we're saying there are rumors against telework, but I can ensure you that is not the case. You will keep your telework, you will keep your two days, only two days in the office. Um, and it's, I mean, uh, this blackmail is not what we, we could accept. In any case, we all understand easily that if we are just two days per week in the office, you cannot pretend to have the same organization of the office in the space as before. Uh, but this is an automatic link that is presented to uh, telework or desking for those and very good offices for the rest is exactly what we are challenging. And I'm very glad to, to, to have you on board on this respect. So we will get in touch in order to organize this study together. We will select uh, the, the samples uh, in order to be really uh, consistent and, and uh, credible about the results and I'm sure that everyone will will be happy at the end also inside the administration to be able to rely on something more than just our own way to see things uh, because they need it. Uh, trade unions uh, in this respect uh, you are mentioned that uh, on this bank they were put on the Really, a basement. We had a, we had another com we had another conference with others uh, that mentioned that in order to sell better road desking, the decision was to provide trade unionists with wonderful offices. In order, <laughs> so it, you know, it's a way to buy their support. Uh, in the commission, is not the case. We are on the first floor, so not basement, not on the penthouse. Uh, but I mean, we have a, we have our role in, inside the, the joint committees, and it's important to provide our reflection also with the, the support of the best expert in Europe. And you are, of course, one of them. Um, so thank you very much again for that. Mm -hmm. For colleagues, the, the um, slides will be published. Um, the record of the com of the conference will be also published. Mm -hmm. Uh, on, our, on our website uh, and we'll get in touch with you, Delphine, in order to, to organize uh, the follow-up and the study. That's perfect. Many thanks. Many thanks and feel free, all of you, to contact me if you wish to read uh, the full document uh, I've been discussing about. Many okay. Thanks. Can we send to you some managers that don't want to change their own office? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yes, that would be a good idea. <laughs> Okay, we will do it. <laughs> thank you very much again, all thank colleagues, you. for being there with us, and thank you, Delphine. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.